We have a very interesting subject this evening, but it is surrounded by extraordinary difficulties. And because these have a direct bearing upon the principal theme, which is a structure of Chinese myths, we must give some attention to them. In the first place, we have almost no knowledge of the origin of Chinese culture. We sometimes feel that China is one of the oldest civilizations of the earth. Uh, this is not strictly true. Certainly it is not true in terms of available and useful records. We know much more about Egypt and India than we do of China. The records of the Egyptians go back much further than anything that is recorded in even the oral traditions of the Chinese. The same may be essentially stated for India, which has a much longer semi-authentic history. The Chinese have also been separated from the common intercourse of the world by an incredible language barrier. It is very difficult for any non-Chinese to acquire a sufficient knowledge of the Chinese language uh, to attempt any scholarly work. The um, ordinary commercial Chinese can be learned in probably ten years, but the scholarly Chinese immediately breaks down into a large group of sub dialectic peculiarities. Not only do we have the various dialects of geographical distribution in China, but we have another dimension of boundaries. This dimension means that a man who became a scholar in literature will be unable to handle most Chinese religion and philosophy in terms of translation. If he is a religionist, he will be unable to translate the political writings. If he is a politician, the scientific writings will be beyond him. The reason, of course, is that the Chinese basic glyphs are subject to many different meanings according to context, and most especially according to the grand area under consideration. Thus, for example, you have to adapt translation of even common uh, figures and ideographs if you are to translate a Chinese religious book. We simply cannot find this common scholarship, the one scholar who, because he is excellent in Chinese, can handle all of these different areas. The areas are very highly specialized. Now, each Chinese word changes not only by these meanings, but by tone. There are four essential tones. The, the sounds are identical, but the to tones differ. And uh, by the tone, the meaning of the word is completely changed. This is almost impossible to learn except by oral instruction. There is no way of determining these tones by which the entire meaning is altered. In addition to this, there is rhythm. And in the Chinese written language, rhythm is to a sentence what tone is to a single glyph. In other words, there are certain ways in which the words are grouped together tonally and rhythmically. And these peculiarities change the meanings of the words, not slightly, but totally. This means that in the course of centuries and ages, the Chinese themselves have been guilty of a great deal of confusion. Most Chinese were not scholars. Therefore, they were inaccurate in their use of their own language. And as a result, words were mysteriously changed 
meanings were altered. And we have really no idea at the present time as to some of the most important basic words and terms of the language. We do not, we do not know how they were originally spoken. We are not entirely sure of how they were written, but we have a fair uh, knowledge of this. But we have even less knowledge of what they meant. There's a language which was rich and scholarly, became a burden upon its own people. The number of separate word forms or syllabic forms is incredible. Between 12 and 15,000 different characters that have to be memorized. The only person who ever graduated from the examination of the classics with a perfect score was Confucius. There is even in China a little deity that uh, rules over the examinations in the universities. It is the duty of this little deity to befuddle the judges so that occasionally someone passes. This is uh, perhaps uh, no more than the summary of an old Chinese experience. We, knew, we do not have very much religious, philosophical tradition bearing upon the Chinese prior to about 2500 B.C. And at this stage, we have very little better than the most abstract myth. Against the unknown background rises the deified form of the Yellow Emperor. In a way, he was the universal genius of China. He was the father not only of his people, but of all their skills, arts, and achievements. He was said to have been a most benevolent man, but it is not inferred, even in these early uh, discussions, that he actually founded the Chinese culture. It seems that something passed to him, which he took hold of and revised, edited, modernized, brought up to the date of his own time. Where this older tradition comes from, no one seems to be very sure. But it is evident from the knowledge attributed to the Yellow Emperor that uh, he must have had available a great deal of earlier information with which to work. This is especially true in his treatise on medicine, which shows that he had a considerable background in a Kabbalism or mysticism or astromancy or theomancy of still earlier times. Actually, the Yellow Emperor is merely a symbol, a name, against the mysterious background of an unknown time and culture. And it was very long before this culture began to emerge into the light of orderly thinking. The golden age of early Chinese culture was certainly the period which produced within China her two greatest sage scholars, Confucius and Lao Tzu. These men flourished between the 5th and 6th centuries B.C. And of them, China will never cease uh, uh, to honor their names or speak well and kindly words. Uh, when I was in Japan last spring, the last Confucian temple in Tokyo, presumably at least, had become partly an art shop, and the proprietress of the shop tried desperately to sell me a picture of Confucius. It was a scroll that was unspeakably bad, artistically. But to this Confucian lady, it was the symbol of all the good and all the wisdom and all the truth and all the virtue that existed in the whole world. And she read me the little poem that was inscribed on the scroll. And it is so typical, I think perhaps you would enjoy it. Wonderful, wonderful Confucius. Before Confucius, there was never a Confucius. At the time of the Confucius, there was not another Confucius. And since Confucius, there has never been a Confucius. Wonderful, wonderful Confucius. Now, the poem was probably worth what she wanted for the scroll, but at the same time, uh, the painting was so bad that it was not very inspiring. But this was the the prevailing theory of the times. Confucius to China 
Well, not the founder of their culture, not the origin of it, was in some way the great personification. Confucius touched the core of Chinese life as no other thinker in the entire history of Chinese civilization has ever succeeded in doing. Around Confucius was built the concept of the sage. And for thousands of years, the sage was the great ideal of Chinese life. The Chinese had a caste system which perhaps originated in India, we are not sure. But anyway, the division was into four orders or groups. The first of these groups and the highest was the scholars. The second below and below them uh, was the agriculturists. Then came the artisans and lowest in the caste scale, merchants. Uh, as in other Asiatic nations, merchants did not rate very high. But these four levels uh, bestowed upon uh, the highest level the great applause, and this was the level of scholars. So a great deal has been said, pro and con, on scholarship in China, and here is a very interesting psychological problem. Those who are fairly well acquainted with the subject are of the opinion that Chinese scholars within the areas of their specializations were among the most accurate, careful, factual, and faithful recorders of any people in the world. The Chinese scholar would rather die than exaggerate. And yet when you read very carefully that which he so soberly sets forth, you wonder whether or not he has spent his life in fairyland. Uh, it does not seem to fit into the very conservative mind. But the Chinese scholar, uh, in many areas, was as broad and informed a thinker as his world and world conditions would permit. The emphasis was nearly always literary there being only two important projects with which a scholar could be concerned, history and literature. There was a kind of a half-grade somewhere along the line set aside to the astronomers who had to calculate the calendar and regulate the crops. But outside of these areas, there was very little scholarship such as we know it. But it is a mistake to think that this was due to the fact that the Chinese were bad thinkers there was nothing else for them to think about. The types of scholarship that we recognize simply did not exist in Chinese life. Sciences as we know them had no place. Foreign languages were not considered at all. There was no access to them. China was a strangely remote and isolated country. It lived behind its own barriers for ages. Within these barriers, it built up a very extensive literature a magnificent poetry and a very brave and uh, cosmopolitan artistry. But outside the areas of its own special interests, the Chinese simply had no experience. Thus we find the introversion of the Confucian scholarship uh, bringing with it particularly emphasis upon personal conduct. There is no other country that has so emphasized self-discipline the regulation of personal affairs according to a high code of honor. The whole Confucian code was one of austerity, honor, self-sacrifice, dedication, loyalty, and courage. By means of his very remarkable mind, Confucius was able to dramatize all of these virtues. He also philosophized them built them into a concept of the state. And on the basis of the concept of the superior man who possessed these attributes, Confucius developed his idea of a world democracy. In this he was far ahead of his time, where many of his concepts are as true and valuable today as when he spoke them 25 centuries ago. Confucius, therefore, was the man of formalities. 
He was, he was something like the reactionary mind of our modern world. He held strongly to tradition. He was responsible for the recognition that the future must be governed by the past, that all things arise from past experience, and that nations become strong to the degree that they value their traditions, uh, defend and support in their own conduct the high concepts of their ancestors. It was inevitable, therefore, that the older Chinese concepts of ancestor worship should have been strongly uh, intensified by the Confucian Code. The Confucian Code made each person responsible to his ancestors for all of his conduct. Any dishonor, any disloyalty, any neglect, any misuse uh, uh, of power or authority disgraced not only the living person but his ancestors to the beginning of time and his descendants on to the unmeasurable future. Therefore, the Chinese scholar lived sort of wedged in between his ancestors and his descendants. And in this position, he had responsibilities to both. And these responsibilities, while they might be a little uh, depressing in their severity, certainly maintained for the Chinese intellectual a comparatively high standard of conduct, causing him to value his honor and his uh, intelligence, his integrity, above most of the selfish things that we value today. In all Chinese philosophy, wealth was not a valuable asset. Confucius did not believe in wealth. He believed in virtue. He believed that man to be rich who had disciplined himself. That man to be great who truly became the servant of all other men. So the Confucian code bound the home together. It dictated the reverences and venerations of the living to the dead and to each other while alive. This code sort of gave a backbone, a very strong, enduring quality to Chinese character. And I suspect this is one of the reasons why China has many times been invaded and conquered by foreign powers, but in the end, it absorbed them all, and nothing remained but Chinese. Chinese culture took over. The second great cultivating and civilizing force of China was the rise within their own nation of the mystic and transcendentalist Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu was the exact reverse of the formalities of scholarship. He was a rebellion against the academic approach to life. He was a creature of freedom of soul. He believed in a strange, deep wildness, in the passion to be wise, to be strong, to be good. There was still a tremendous adventure. And so to Lao Tzu, the formalities were secondary. A man's real purpose was to reach out with an experience of heart, soul, and mind and come into a benevolent, degree of understanding between himself and everything else that existed. Lao Tzu, therefore, took a very much older term, Tao, and applied it to this concept of a universal, all-permeating life. A life everywhere and in everything that could be experienced. A life that cut through all stations and all levels of social advancement or prestige and brought the common man and the great man into common unity with truth itself. In the beginning, as might be imagined, the philosophy of Lao Tzu was entirely too abstract for the average person. Now, Taoism was in a dilemma from the beginning. Obviously, it would be rejected by the Confucian intellectuals. The second thing, it would be unintelligible to the masses. There was really nothing left. Uh, the great levels which uh, dominated Chinese culture were all addicted to other pursuits. And Taoism remained an almost um, 
a mirage-like structure for a good many centuries. It had a few followers, most of them rebels like Lao Tzu himself, individuals who departed from the world for one reason or another, retired into distant places to cultivate the monastic mysticisms that are born in some men, but which very seldom appear in number sufficient to balance other forces in society. Well, uh, Taoism remained comparatively uh, unfruitful in Chinese life until it was able to borrow help and uh, encouragement from another system. This other system was Buddhism. And uh, because Buddhism and Taoism had so much in common in the terms of their transcendentalism, in their recognition of invisible, mystical, idealistic factors. They formed a kind of fraternity. Buddhism probably realized that Lao Tzu had derived much of his inspiration from the ancient manuscripts and books that had reached him from India. As librarian of the great library of the Chu, uh, Lao Tzu had access uh, to much of the wisdom literature of Asia. In any event, the Buddhists reaching China found that something similar to themselves had already arisen there. And this thing that had arisen was uh, Taoism. Of course, it had a strangely florid complexion. The Taoism of China was far more fanciful uh, than the teachings of Gautama Buddha. But there were these subjective similarities that could not be overlooked. Buddhism, of course, came from India and uh, found its peculiar place in Chinese life. It is easy to understand why the Chinese would need it, why it meant something to them so important that they took hold upon it. The reason was not the same, for instance, that made Buddhism acceptable to the Japanese. The Japanese were at the beginning of a culture desperately striving to build a civilization. The Chinese already had a culture and a civilization long before Buddhism reached them. So in China, it was intended primarily to enrich the inner consciousness of the individual and to give a long-range perspective of human origin and destiny something at that time lacking among the Chinese people. Buddhism brought to them worship. Worship in an intelligible way. A worship that permitted the individual uh, to find certain venerable beings or venerable principles worthy of his worship and his acceptance. Buddhism mingling with Taoism produced a very interesting polyglot. Uh, the uh, Buddhists began to take on some Taoistic attributes, and Taoism was practically reformed. Uh, out of the Buddhist contact came, uh, we might say, religious Taoism, or a formal theological system, such as now exists in China. From the Buddhists, the Taoists took their concept of the temple, the altar, the clergy, uh, brought various symbols together, created their parallel triads, evolved their doctrines of saints and superphysical beings, all organized gradually into patterns based upon Buddhist thought. Thus, they had a considerable indebtedness and they recognized it, and Buddhism and Taoism managed to get along pretty well uh, in China. There was very little real antagonism, perhaps a little, you might say, jealousy on the part of the Taoists because they were not quite as successful as the Buddhists. But both Taoism and Buddhism had to unite against the common enemy of Confucianism. They would not have had any trouble with Confucius. But Confucianism had changed considerably by the time the partnership between Taoism and Buddhism was completed in the early years of the Christian era. Uh, the Confucian code uh, was 
very reactionary, and of course, rather morally materialistic. Uh, Confucius was an ideal moralist in a sense, but he refused to consider much of anything except behavior. He was perhaps the great Chinese behaviorist. He was not much given to hope of what lay beyond the grave. He had no real concept of universal laws behind human behavior. He was tied to a strange combination of intellectualism and early deity worship that had come down from very much older times in Chinese history. The Confucians, therefore, represented a kind of intellectual aristocracy, and they intended, if possible, to hold this position at all costs. They surrounded the emperor and dominated uh, the, the Chinese government for centuries. And under this domination, every effort was made to kill out what might be termed the mystical content in religious living and thinking. Everything was reduced to its formality. Now, the same thing happened in Korea, which came very strongly under these pressures, being so nearly related to China. The great creative period in Korean art and religion, philosophy, was the Buddhist period. But at the beginning of the Yi dynasty, uh, the ambitious rulers realized that the advancement of temporal power, the conquest of new territory, the taking on of colonies, the expanding of temporal authority, these could not be really achieved while Buddhism dominated Korea. What happened was that when the emperor of Korea wished to raise an army, all the young men became Buddhist monks and wouldn't fight. To meet this, the Korean government outlawed Buddhism. Now, the same thing happened to a measure in China. Uh, when peace and happiness and uh, security seemed to reign, the Taoists and the Buddhists had a small chance of things. But whenever it seemed that severity of some kind or another, wars, internal disturbances, uh, threatened the security of the central government, then the Buddhists were persecuted, simply because they would not play party politics. This went on for a great many centuries, on and off, down through time. And the Confucian Taoist Buddhist fight was finally carried to Japan, where at various periods the Buddhists triumphed and at other times the Confucianists took over. It was a struggle between two opposing concepts. Uh, the Confucianists gave to Japan the Code of Bushido, or the Code of the Samurai the uh, high-minded one who lived the most severe and austere life, bound by dedications of absolute loyalty and required by the simple code of the samurai to die without hesitation or a moment of regret in the service of his lord. There must be no question about this absolute fidelity. This was obviously a Confucian factor. Well, these car codes went back and forth in China, and by degrees, among the various patterns that crisscrossed and made new combinations and got mixed up with some very bad language forms, there came a series of designs which we now recognize as the essential tapestry of Chinese mythology and lore. I think we can say that the Chinese at one of the most unique uh, concepts of the universe uh, that we have in mythology. Uh, they simply divided the world in which we live into two parts, one visible and the other invisible. And the invisible was an exact duplicate of the Chinese empire. It was the same in all essential respects. Uh, the invisible China, for which it really was, uh, had its own emperor, it had its mandarins and its high court officials, 
It had its statesmen and scholars and agriculturists and merchants. It had everything a visible China. It also had something that you do not find in most other mythologies, uh, the power of advancing and uh, degrading the gods themselves. In other words, if one of the high deities of China uh, antagonized a higher deity of China, the higher deity could demote it. Uh, exile it. And if this deity had offended greatly and required the most unbelievable torment, the higher god could force him to be reborn in this world, which was regarded as about the worst uh, thing that could happen to anyone. Also over there, godlings of secondary and tertiary importance, by extraordinary uh, vigilance or fidelity to office, might be advanced so that a god of the third estate might in time work his way up to a higher station. It's all rather interesting because it was so closely related to a highly materialistic concept. It was simply that the invisible was an abode of beings, many of which owed their divine estate to man himself. We have some other religions that have this peculiar uh, practice of saying who is divine and who is not, but the Chinese worked it to a very high degree. Therefore, the emperor of China himself could make or name a god who would thereafter have a high position in the invisible universe. If one of the emperor's descendants didn't like this god, he could degrade him. There was nothing permanent in heaven any more than on earth in the Chinese way of things. The Chinese heavens, if you want to say that, the invisible world of things, it was uh, populated with the most grotesque assortment of miscellaneous divinities that has ever been assembled in any theology. There is nothing remotely like it anywhere. One of the reasons there is nothing remotely like it is because there is no special order in anything. There is no single tree upon which all these gods and godlings grew. They are not there for any particular organized purpose. Most of them were as self-centered as the mandarins on earth. Uh, they had their own private prerogatives. They had the various tasks that were appointed to them. They fulfilled many different offices much of the fulfillment consisting of little more than growling in their beards. There does not seem to have been any uh, active symbolism around a central core, such as you find in most religions. Uh, it would be almost impossible to try to fit a moral code into this pattern, or fit this pattern into any ethical system. It does not break down symbolically and into any nice, clean, cosmological structure. It is a mass of circumstances which seem to have arisen over very long periods of time in different areas, in different culture levels, and according to different codes of conduct, all dumped together into this mysterious place that is just beyond the grave. But this place was divided, of course, as in almost all religions, into abodes of punishment and reward. And there was no one that could work out a more incredible group of punishments than the Chinese. Not only were they famous for their torture devices for the living, but they continued these in a marvelous way into the regions beyond the grave. Some of their suggestions, however, were not too bad. They had a very terrible torture and an absolute agony forever to any individual who mutilated a good book. That was a very serious offense. Any individual also who stole anything from the poor had a very bad time of it. And uh, individuals who took public charity funds and used them for personal gain went into one of the deepest pits of perdition. They also had a very horrible penalty, something like being drawn and quartered forever for any individual who knowingly circulated a book, a story, an article, or anything which would tend to lower morality. You might need that old saw around here sometime. 
But each of these various tasks was set aside to some god, godling or goblin. So there was a particular deity who had charge of every one of these innumerable tasks. And when the deities themselves assigned someone to the care or to the punishment of one of these other goblings, the whole matter, even in the invisible world, was one of high ceremonialism. It, and even the gods did not speak to each other unless formally introduced. The formalities of the Confucian Code went right on into the other world. Now, how did the gods of the other world get there? Where did they come from? Apparently, here again, no one was quite certain that many of these deities belong to some primitive theology that possibly came from further to the west, perhaps even as far as Persia or Arcadia. This is quite probable, but I think we may say that most of the gods of the Chinese pantheon were deified human beings. Each one of them was backed by a legend of his own earthly existence. He represented a reward for some kind of a peculiar achievement, great courage, great dedication, great self-sacrifice. All of these, if they reached a degree of noteworthiness, could well start someone on the way to canonization. I think we might say that the gods of the Chinese invisible universe could be parallel to the statues of famous persons in the Hall of Fame. We have a Hall of Fame for them here. Uh, they did not have anything like that in China, so they simply turned the invisible universe over to them. And they uh, carried on uh, various tasks, they enjoyed themselves, they fulfilled the merits which they had earned uh, by um, living, performing various duties. They were not completely idle. They had to sort of administer the destinies of these human beings who were constantly moving from the visible world of man into this invisible region, uh, which uh, was so highly fantastic that it appears that the Chinese finally gave it up themselves. Uh, the Chinese did not seem to be too much concerned with any of this uh, by the time Buddhism took hold. Uh, the, the whole situation was too confusing and, and too uh, comparatively irrelevant. The one exception to all this, of course, was the ancestor. Among the deities uh, were the deified emperors, obviously, the great uh, deified councillors of state, the few victorious generals the Chinese were ever able to canonize because they were not particularly successful in military operations, scholars, poets, literary men, artists, musicians, uh, and a whole variety of faithful mortals of lesser estate who were associated with some great deed of virtue or goodness like the famous series of the 24 examples of filial piety, in which uh, children really attained immortality because of their virtuous care of their parents under the most difficult situations. So into this invisible realm also passed the ancestors. And in China, an individual became a little bit divine simply by the process of dying. It wasn't quite true, however, because uh, there could be living gods. Ancestors could be divine while they were alive, but they at least rose one step after they passed out of this life. But the veneration for ancestor uh, drifted very close toward true worship. And uh, in the patriarchal system of these people, the living ancestors were of the highest importance. And when they disappeared and their tablets were placed in the ancestral shrine, they were almost gods. They could be besought to.
to help in all kinds of emergencies. There is a little bit of parallel between this concept and modern spiritualism, with the exception that in China this spiritualism was largely a family affair. Where they did not really expect the descendants of other families to be concerned with them. It was only their own who would continually watch over them and would guard them and would make, a, make an unbroken line of virtue between them and the first cause of things. Little by little, however, this immense pantheon began to lose most of its vitality. Uh, polytheism here went to such an extent uh, that it lost uh, central strength. It lost a basic core, even in the matter of the principal deities, and there was a monotheism underneath all of this. It is hard to differentiate just who the one God actually was. He was known to be there, but it was very hard to uh, discover him, to identify him. Finally, the Chinese, God ridden in the most uh, abundant manner, uh, began, as we have said, uh, to break away from this very confusing situation. And from this tendency to break away, aided and abetted by the Confucians, uh, the Taoists themselves, and the Buddhists, we find the gradual emergence of a more or less uh, unified Chinese mythology. It is not unified as the Greek is, or as the Japanese is but it is unified comparatively in terms of that which preceded it in China itself. And out of this general unification of things, uh, there came a very interesting basic legendary, a legendary that uh, more and more shows influence from other outside sources that was certainly made Chinese in every sense of the word by the beliefs and uh, policies of the state and also of the people. In this more or less simplified form, uh, a pattern of achievements was set up. And there arose among the Chinese thinkers this concept of the immortals. This was also a very interesting Chinese phase. The immortals were mostly Taoist in origin. They took on many of the uh, austerities and the formalities of the Confucians, and they were, into a measure, uh, given form, appearance, likeness, and the state by the uh, older teachings from India of the Lohan Aha Rishis of Mahatma. But the immortals came to be the uh, Chinese first line of invisibles, and they were not entirely invisible for that matter. But the immortals were divided into three orders, or three ranks, in China. The first rank was simply called the immortals. Uh, the second rank was referred to as the heroes. And the third and highest rank was referred to as the saints. So thus they more or less fall under our idea of canonization to a certain degree. Buddhism molded the characteristics of these immortals to a considerable degree. But at the same time, the magic and alchemy of Taoism and the strange ancestral uh, patterns of Confucian worship were also present. What was a Chinese immortal? He was a person who usually had departed completely from the world. He was a hermit or a forest dweller. He was one who had dedicated himself to the attainment of insight, to the unfoldment of his own mystical and divine nature. He was a person of great determination and of high integrity. He was a person who believed that there were secrets by means of which the regeneration of his own body could be accomplished, that by the use of alchemies he could form universal medicines, and that by the study of the stars he could bind to himself the genii of planets. 
Taoism. He also affirmed or believed uh, that by these meditative and other disciplines, he could become free from the contamination of worldly illusion and finally I'll, uh, enter into the presence of infinite and total reality, Buddhism. So our immortal had all of these characteristics. Another peculiar thing about immortals, in fact, most of the deities of China, is that their artistic representation is a little difficult for us. So many of these deities, although of benign nature, are presented in the most grim and foreboding appearance. They are not a cheerful lot by any means, nor are they outstandingly handsome, although perhaps they look better to the Chinese than they do to us. But to the most part, for the most part, they are rather grotesque, theater creatures, more like the actors in some ancient Chinese play than uh, deities presumably having spiritual powers in another life. The immortals gain certain knowledge. Uh, by austerity. The code was rather simple. In order to gain something of the invisible world, you had to give up something here. The more you gained over there, the more you had to renounce here. But this renunciation was not a deprivation. For what you gained in insight was worth infinitely more than you renounced to get it. <coughs> Thus the Chinese immortal having renounced uh, anything like nation, country, family, home, village, uh, the little piece of land on which he dwelt, was rewarded for giving up this little square of earth by being made a citizen of the whole world. Instead of being bound to his community, no matter how high he might be elevated as a local magistrate, he became capable of traveling with the speed of thought into all the parts of the world. In the result, as a result of giving up uh, a certain kind of wealth that he might accumulate a few dollars here, he gained the mysterious wealth of being able to produce at will anything he wanted out of his own consciousness. Step by step, he departed from the world by attaining to uh, uh, privileges and powers and values that are entirely apart from this world. The end, the end of the immortal, as far as in Chinese thought, is that he would attain what the term implied, immortality. He would never die. He could take on bodies whenever he pleased. He could take on any form that he wanted. But he could never die. Therefore, whenever he disappeared, people said he was dead, but he appeared somewhere else. And like the strange, mysterious masters of alchemy, he traveled about the world in disguise. He took any form he wanted to. He had magical powers and mystical abilities. He was like a genii. He was a truly wonderful being who appeared to be mortal, uh, but could fly around the air on the backs of cranes or ride across the sea on the back of a fish. He had a horse, one of the immortals had a horse, and he kept in a gourd on his belt. And every time he wanted to, he opened the gourd, and the horse came out, became full size, and he rode off on the horse. When he was tired of the horse and wanted to staple it, all he just did was hold out the gourd, and the horse went back into it again. He created anything he wanted, he had anything he wanted. But in order to achieve this, he must want nothing material. He must give up every desire for material things. Here we have, as I think you can gather, a series of different culture factors. This rejection of materiality, this attainment of limitlessness by, uh, by transcending the concept of limitation is almost certainly Buddhist in its beginnings, or else arises from the earlier Hindu schools from which Buddhism itself came. The mysterious miracles the horse and the gourd and other things are a pure metaphysics of late Taoism. And this rigid code of self-conquest by which the uh, immortal achieved through complete sacrifice and integration and dedication 
would be a little of the Confucian spirit. So he really represented all three. Now, above the level of the immortal was the next, uh, higher, and that was the hero. Now, the hero was much in the same spirit as the Greek hero. Now, just as Achilles and Ulysses and Aeneas and others of the great heroic order of the Greeks they were immortalized by the gods for some extraordinary achievement. So in China, the heroes represented the persons who did not enter into this dream of immortality uh, by long self-discipline, but by some one or small group of transcendent actions by which their highest integrity was demonstrated beyond question. The hero was always the person of self-sacrifice. But he might also be a person of transcendent wisdom. He was someone so good, so noble, so great, that all who came after him venerated his name. He was a, he was a symbol sometimes of unusual righteousness under tremendous provocation or temptation to dishonesty. But he had to be a person who won a great battle against weakness, against evil, against some force contrary to the total good of mankind. So the hero, when he arose with all these attributes, was simply picked up and taken to heaven, like the Greeks of the ancient legends become a star or a constellation or to have some wonderful place in the invisible universe of things. The third level of the immortals was the saints. And the saints, of course, did not take on very much Confucian coloring. They were mostly a mingling of Taoism and Buddhism. The saints were a little different from the immortals. The immortals had more of the tinge of the magician in them. They were wonder workers. They were strange, sprightly creatures who uh, really fulfilled our idea almost of pixies or of strange, wonderful sprites. They were in human form, and they might be very elderly gentlemen of misshapen body or strange, distorted expression. But they were kind of crafty. They were clever. They had a strange, wild sense of humor. And also, down underneath it all, uh, there was a kind of selfishness in them. They were searching for one thing and they found it, immortality. And they found it by means of the cultivation of magical arts. Uh, like uh, the dream of Faust, they had about it a certain strange, subtle self-seeking. The true saint in China was free from all of this. The true saint was the benefactor, and the intermediary. Now, the saint in China was more like the concept of the Christian saint. Prayers could be addressed to him. Uh, the saint in China was the one who could intercede uh, between uh, mortals and some one of these great courts of justice or injustice that governed the invisible universe. The saint was unworldly absolutely pure, without self-interest of any kind. He had renounced even immortality. He didn't ask for it. And because he had renounced both life and death, he entered living into the state of eternity. He was uh, really approaching the Buddhist concept of nirvana. He was in this great experience of total selflessness. There was no longer a desire to live or to die. There was simply this inevitable urge, an irresistible pressure to be of service to mankind. And this, of course, was very largely shaped from Buddhism. But these three together represented a kind of ascending order of human regenerated persons. But we know there's another factor that uh, arises in this that parallels to some measure Tibetan philosophy. That is that from all of these legends there comes the brief suspicion that gains ground, however, 
that in some way these stories are ritualistic. Just as there is much evidence, for example, that the Apocalypse of John was originally used as a ritual of initiation into the early Christian mysteries, so it would seem that these Chinese legends, particularly those of the three immortals, the three levels of immortals, ties into uh, secret societies and esoteric orders in China. And we are not surprised, therefore, to find uh, the three levels of the immortals in the Hung Association or the secret Freemasonry of China. We are not surprised to see the candidate advance from one degree to the next until finally he attained to sainthood. Ritualistically and symbolically, uh, his advance represented the unfoldment of his own internal life. So out of the mingling of these three religions, Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism, there finally did come an integrated concept of human growth. The human growth dependent upon uh, the understanding of universal laws and man's personal obedience to these laws. So now we can get a little kind of look the Chinese universe. The Chinese universe was brought into existence as a result of the mingling of two principles, the yang and the yin. These principles were in the form of air. And from the union of these two airs whirling together, uh, there came into existence the mysterious symbol of the yin-yang, the circle that is divided into two comma-like parts. The mingling of these two forces produced the first being. And this first being is perhaps very closely related to Ymir in the Scandinavian rites, the frost giant from whose body the world was fashioned. For from the fa body of the first Chinese being, the world itself was formed. This being is usually represented in ancient art as a rustic or a person of the soil, an agriculturist, or something of that nature, dressed in leaves, and sometimes carrying in his hands the symbol of the sun and moon, or of the trigrams, or of the great combinations of the characters associated to Fu Yi. This being is distinguished from other characters in Chinese mythology by the fact that he is very human in appearance, but has two short knobby horns on his forehead. Now uh, this was the being from whose body later all things of the earth were fashioned. And it was out of the disintegration and decomposition of this being that all creatures came forth to begin the population and the covering of the earth's surface with life. There then appeared two beings, a male and female principle, one representing the male part of the eating and the other the female. And they are represented as two beings with bodies of serpents and human heads. And one of them carries the architect's square and the other the architect's compass. And because of the fact that these two primordial artificers carried the compass and square gave also further encouragement to a, a possible Masonic interpretation of the symbolism. In any event, these two beings, brother and sister, both with their bodies ending in serpents, brought forth the organized architectural concept of the world, placed it upon its foundations, and set it up very much according to the Hindu theory. The world was divided into continents. It was formed into great circles, in the midst of which rose a mountain. And this mountain, which came from the very center of a sort of flat dish-like earth, was the same Samiru, Miru, of Kalasa, the great mountains of the religions of India, Tibet, and uh, Chinese Buddhism. This mountain was the Axis mountain of the world. And upon the slopes and crests of this mountain was the abode of the gods, particularly the superior beings. Now, the Chinese do not have quite the concept, as we've suggested, of superior beings uh, that we understand in our way of thinking. Uh, for the abstract and eternal being, they were perhaps a little inclined to the concept of Tao, the nameless, 
the thing that could not be described, the spirit that could not be measured, could not be symbolized, could not be revealed by any definition possible to man. But this particular abstract deity was represented by a hierarchy of mandarins, councillors, chancellors, and high officials, all of whom had something to do with the general management of creation. So if we see this now, we see the whole thing lying in China itself. China was called the Middle Kingdom. Therefore, the mountain of the gods rose from the center of China. Around it were the provinces, all of the departments and divisions of the Chinese state. And in the universe, these departments, which were merely the amplification of the provinces of China, were assigned to certain deities, so that each province had its guiding spirit, and each community had its ancestral godling or some hero associated with it. Uh, around and on the sides of this great mountain that seemed to rise were the abodes of the immortals. And also the Chinese recognized five sacred mountains. These five sacred mountains being sacred to the five elements and also uh, to the uh, division that the Chinese made of the world which was the four corners in the center. These mountains were all ruled over by deities, and there was a very important god assigned to the great peaks of each of these mountain ranges. And in the highlands of these mountains, up above the clouds, where you could no longer uh, see the world below, uh, were the homes of spirits. The Chinese apparently had a tendency who assign to their demigods some kind of remote earthly habitation. This is a little like the Greeks who chose Mount Olympus uh, for the great judgment hall of their deities. The Chinese did the same thing. Their divinities did not really simply float in the air. They were not totally invisible in the sense that they had no corporeal consideration. Uh, they lived some way uh, in the mountains. They had remote places of dwelling. You have the same thing in India where the rishis and the great immortal mortals, even Shiva himself, may have a habitation among the mighty peaks of Himavat. In the distant mountains, which seem to be enough of a symbol to divide the normal conditions from the mysteries of religion, were therefore an accumulation of immortals. Not just a group of eight, with which we are more or less generally familiar, but countless sages, the countless wonderful beings, all living in strange places. At one time, one of the great centers was believed to be the Diamond Mountains of Korea. Then there was another great center, more mythological and mysterious, the Jade Mountains, where the highest of the immortals, uh, dwelt together in endless bliss. Now, what the immortals did while they were at home is uh, not quite clear to everyone, but they did have uh, various tasks. Uh, they were concerned with the maintenance of forms of life. Some of these immortals are similar in their activities to the nature spirits of medieval Europe, or to the various nymphs and gnomes and dryades of uh, the Greeks and Latin and early Goths. All of these uh, immortals were in some way doing something. One immortal was the one who made the flowers to grow. Another immortal, the immortal was the one that made the trees to bear their fruit. So without an immortal hovering around, very little worldly uh, accomplishment was possible. There were immortals that whispered into the ears of poets. There were immortals who comforted uh, sick children. Uh, there were immortals that walked with the blind so that they would not stumble. There was some god, godling, or saint for every problem that you could possibly imagine. 
Well, that the people had a kind of a friendly feeling for these divinities, but as I say, do not seem to have taken them too seriously in common daily worship. The uh, land of the immortals was a very beautiful place, and it was far above any mysterious purgatorial realms below. And according to the Chinese, you really had to be pretty bad not to find some place among the immortals. If your own generation did not honor you, one of your descendants would discover some secret virtue and you would be elevated to this noble estate. The Chinese did also have records or evidence of re-embodiment. They apparently believed in reincarnation. Uh, not quite in the same way that the Buddhists did, but after Buddhism came in, they accepted it. And most uh, Buddhists and Taoists and many Confucianists today do accept reincarnation. The religion sort of amalgamated and uh, the three formed the one religion that has descended into modern China. So in the midst of all the world, there was a great mountain that went up almost to the sky. It was so great and so wonderful that human beings could hardly uh, imagine its splendor. Its hallways were of jade. All of the floors were of alabaster. And uh, the roofs and tiles, the ramparts were of lapis. And all the railings and all the ponds were of gold. And at the bottom of each pool, the sand was gold and silver. And the flowers all blossomed with diamonds and rubies. It was really an extraordinary place. It was a wonderful world that could have been taken out of the Arabian Nights entertainment. Now, occasionally, mortals, even in this world, were permitted to go to this great palace, the great place on the top of the mountain. And if you want to know how big this palace really was, you must realize that it was 330 miles in circumference, with its ramparts of the most precious metal, and the trees that grew there, that grew leaves of gold and silver themselves, and the little buds that burst open were pearls. Yet all these things were due to the wonderful magic and sorcery of these uh, wonderful magicians, these wonderful spirit god wonder workers uh, that formed this part of the Chinese mythology. So under certain conditions, as we say, a person in the material world uh, might be permitted to go to see what was going on in this world. Of wonder. And uh, if they were living or born in one of the provinces of China, and this great good was to be accorded to them, they might as they walked along the roads or the pathways to their little homes, suddenly see in the way a tiger standing. Now this would be a rather frightening experience, but the tiger always spoke very civilly. And the tiger reminded them that he was not really a tiger at all, but that he was the spirit who carried people uh, from the earth to paradise. But as long as they rode on his back, they were perfectly safe. And he invited this selected individual, who, by the way, had been passed and approved by the Lord High Secretary on the top of the mountain. As this person was then allowed to ride on the tiger, and of course in three bounds, the tiger crossed the surface of the world. Uh, he was a really a very skillful traveler. And at last they came to the foot of the mountain upon which the palace stood. And here, of course, were the great gods with their heavy swords, their helmets, their wonderful plumed uh, robes hung with feathers. Uh, also, uh, very grim expressions and extraordinary beards. These guards grumbled and mumbled, but when accompanied by the spirit tiger, the visitor was officially permitted to enter. And as the visitor went on and on and on, up to these great staircases toward the top of the mountain, it was just as though he was entering the palace of the emperor in ancient Peking. Each step as he advanced, 
chamberlains appeared, mandarins with the different colored buttons on their hats, the eight colored robes of those who were the servants of heaven. Little by little he ascended, passing through these wonderful screens of mother of pearl, going over all these uh, doorways and thresholds, uh, with uh, floors made of the most precious marbles, the most precious stones, uh, with uh, the lights of hotels and things of this nature. Very uh, festive. And so finally, coming to the great jade staircase, uh, the visitor was allowed to enter into the abode of the great immortals. Now here in the abode of the great immortals, you might meet almost anyone that was important in the great history of Chinese life, culture, and achievement. And uh, according to some legends, you find Jesus there, waiting in his study, regarding the deportment of heaven as he had guarded the virtues of the earth. You might find also all Outsi, but he'd be probably on the opposite side of the palace because he and Confucius never did get along too well. And uh, little things like death do not change such matters. Buddha probably would not be there because he would naturally be as assumed to go back to the land of his own origin. But great Chinese Buddhist saints would be there, as old Daruma mumbling and grumbling in his beard. But the great uh, saints of the Huayang or the vo great school of the void would be there. The Chinese scholars, all of the people who were uh, doing good and doing uh, services to mankind. And you would go still further, perhaps, because you were invited to this special occasion, and you would finally come into the audience chamber of the Queen of Heaven. And this is interesting also, because while in the Chinese mythology there was also a King of Heaven, you very seldom hear anything about him. Uh, the system was evidently derived from a very ancient matriarchal period in Chinese culture. The King of Heaven was formed of the breath of the eastern air. And he was supposed to be a very wonderful God and guide to all virtue and good things. He was the master of the Yi Jing, the classic of changes. He was the one who in some striving way, in some deep, mysterious manner, managed to maintain the equilibrium of the universe. But this process apparently was so ar arduous that he seldom took, place, uh, took part in social activities. The Queen of Heaven, however, was rather uh, a different type. She was supposed to have been the most beautiful mortal who was ever created, because she was mortal originally, and she was fashioned from the breath of the Western Heaven. And she was completely virtuous, completely beautiful, completely pure in every way. And she was also strangely referred to in symbolism as the mother of the portals. She was the mother of the golden symbol of eternal life. In her uh, full robes, dignities, and honors, she was usually attended by the phoenix bird as the symbol also of everlasting. And if you were by some reason or purpose uh, allowed to enter into her presence and make your necessary and proper obeisances to this divine throne, you would find her enthroned upon the throne of the golden phoenix, surrounded by jewels and curtains of silk formed from the very uh, mist of heaven itself. You would be in a vast throne room more magnificent than anything on earth because if the Chinese liked one thing more than another, it was magnificent. And because most of them hardly had a square meal on earth, magnificence was a great spiritual significance to them. Now, if you were called on to visit this queen upon this day, you might perhaps arrive on the day of her birth, her birthday. Well, unlike ordinary mortals, uh, the Queen of Heaven, or the Queen of the Sacred and Celestial City, had a birthday only once every 3,000 years. So you had to sort of catch that particular day if you expected to be present. On the, uh, the calendar up there, and the symbol of it all, was measured by the blooming of the peach tree of immortality. 
This tree it had new buds every 3,000 years, and this was a very important occasion and constituted one of the queen's birthdays. After 3,000 years of maturing from the bud, the fruit became ripe, and that was the next occasion of great rejoicing. Because this fruit of the peach of everlastingness was the symbol of the continuing life of all things, and when this time came for the feast of the Queen's birthday, all of the genii, all of the immortals, all of the mysterious sages and saints of the Diamond Mountains and of the Jade Stone Peaks, all that belonged to the wise all over the world came there. When China finally discovered there was something outside of China, but there were other countries, uh, the mythology graciously extended to all countries, for it was assumed that in every land there were immortals, that every civilization produced its saints and heroes and sages. And on the great 3,000-year occasion of the birthday of the Queen of Heaven, all of these wise men from everywhere assembled to take place in what one missionary writer uh, said with his tongue in his cheek was the Chinese equivalent of the Eucharist. It was uh, a great ecumenical council in which the wise from everywhere came to share together the fruit of the peach of everlastingness. And there were great processions and great ceremonies. And the uh, Queen of Heaven with all her retinues and with all her nobles and all her assistants and associates uh, took part in the great banquet. And there were great tables spread out, spread out of the palace, and musicians were called, and sacred dances to perform the ceremonial rites. And all the princes and heroes of the earth who were gathered there were glad to be servants on this great occasion. And so the legends go on of all the magnificence that marked this mysterious journey uh, of a mortal to be present at the feast of the Queen of the Universe. And we think this over a little bit and see what we can make out of it, and we may find some rather interesting things. There seems to be no doubt whatever that this legend passed through a number of changes in, in the descent of things. We know that this Queen of Heaven was made of the air of the West, the winds and vapors that arose in the western corner of the world. And there was a, a certain mysterious hint here, a certain similarity that we cannot entirely ignore between this whole story and the mysterious accounts of the western paradise of Amitabha Buddha. And it looks as though this was the Chinese version of it. Furthermore, the Queen of Heaven actually comes very close uh, to the uh, Buddhist Kuan Yin. By the time uh, this Bodhisattva was male in India and in Tibet, and is also sometimes represented as male in Japan, in China became almost completely female. So that the goddess Kuan Yin uh, became, in a sense, uh, the representative and the agent, in fact, was the direct descent of the Amida Buddha. For the uh, Amida Buddha was the father of Kuan Yin. So the elusive, mysterious, and invisible king of this region might well be the Amida Buddha. And the visible, glorious Queen of Heaven bestowing immortality as she bestowed mercy, could also very likely tie into the concept of Kuan Yin, or the goddess of mercy. And in the Western paradise, you have almost the same story, the jewel trees, and the diamond sands, the magnificent buildings, the great temples and shrines, all of the feasting, all of the pools of lotus flowers, everything that you also find in the Chinese account. So what we are probably thinking of is the western paradise of Amitabha. And in this western paradise also there grew a tree of, of mysterious 
benefits to the nations, the tree that was for the healing of the nations, as we find in the book of Revelation. And this tree that bore all manner of fruit seems to have some relation to this peach tree of eternal life. So what, what appears to be the meaning behind it all is uh, that there is a universe, we might say, of the quality of Kornman or Kornian, the universe of eternal compassion, and that the individual who is regarded as worthy to be present in this strange ecumenical congress held on the top of the mountain, the person worthy to be present journeys into the realms of infinite compassion, infinite beauty, infinite wonder, departing from all worldliness and all contamination and all material things. For all these treasures are, of course, invisible. They are spiritual treasures which are stored up in heaven alone. So the uh, attitude has been to make the treasures of heaven more glorious than anything that could be upon earth. And those who have merited or earned these various good things are supposed to be permitted to feast together in the uh, sacrament of the renewal of their spiritual insight. I think we also have to try to find a little more of the story of the um, Buddhist principles here. Actually, in the Lotus of the Good Law Sutra, uh, the Buddha himself uh, creates a spectacle out of his own mind uh, that is very close in its absolute grandeur uh, to the concept of the paradise or the marvelous palace of the Queen of the West. Uh, this uh, Buddhistic fable causes all the universe to gather uh, around this great mountain upon which the Master is seated on his lotus throne. And the coming of the universe is a spectacle beyond comparison or thought, inasmuch as the beings of 10,000 times 10 million worlds are there from space, from every direction of the cosmos, from the most remote star, uh, from that which lies beyond all visibility, from times past and for times to come, all beings gather at this great occasion to receive the particular benediction or blessing of the true doctrine. From the Chinese point of view, I think that we have to accept uh, that the peach of immortality, like Jason's golden fleece hanging upon a tree, and many other similar symbols, that the preach of immortality is the Chinese symbol of absolute truth, of universal wisdom, of that which bestows beyond all doubt and beyond all question uh, the continuance forever of consciousness. The peach, therefore, is more than an alchemical symbolism. It is the symbol, actually, of utter reality itself. It is the symbol of perfection, of the, of the perfect unfoldment of consciousness. Therefore, this peach must naturally and inevitably grow in the human heart. And the marvelous palace and everything that has to do with the ceremony seems to be ritualistic. The queen with her peach tree also appears in the, so in the rituals of the Hung Association, indicating that it was intended to be a ritualistic drama. The uh, entire experience, therefore, is the result of merit, of a strange mingling and gathering of things. The Chinese had a little different concept of what constituted merit. They were not quite as uh, severe or as simple in their thinking as the Buddhists of Japan or Korea. To them, merit involved all of the great achievements. It involved not only the dignity and honors and integrities of Confucius, but also the metaphysical insight of Lao Tzu 
and the eternal patient acceptance of karma which we find in the doctrine of Buddha. All these things had to be combined in the creation of the Chinese immortal. But as a result of his achieving these things, he attained to the Chinese concept of immortality. The Chinese did not have the idea of the individual disappearing into some kind of a nirvana. This concept did not come to them until after the arrival of Buddhism. Prior to that time, their heaven was more like the heavens of some of the older European nations. It was a place of eternal joy, a place of everlasting happiness. And the symbolism is not, is not too awkward if you uh, begin to try to understand also the Western equivalent of it. In the West, we have always thought of heaven as the place of the rewards of the righteous. Today, if you ask a hundred persons who are believers in modern Christian religion just what kind of a heaven they expect to find if they make it, uh, there is going to be some difference of opinion here. Some are going to feel that heaven would not be heaven unless it was a place of happiness, unless the individual was reunited with his loved ones, unless the, it was the end of pain and sorrow. But very few orthodox people would think of heaven as the end of themselves. They would consider a place of eternal reward for a minimum of good accomplished by them in this present world. The Chinese follow this very closely. The Buddhists came in and interpreted it for them. The Buddhists came in and explained to them, and the Chinese accepted it also, because again it played back into the three religions. Uh, these religions mixed mingled back and forth, each supporting the other in a very strange and sometimes very wonderful way. The Buddha said, yes, this uh, marvelous symbolism of the Queen of Heaven and her wonderful palace is surely only a mental phenomenon. Actually, you don't really believe that there is such a place. It isn't necessary that you believe it that way. Or if you do believe it that way, then it exists only because of your believing. And it is quite conceivable that if all your life you have believed in this kind of a glorious heaven world with jade and opal and wonderful birds singing and flowers and uh, all these ritualistic things, if you believe this and die with this in your consciousness, you will certainly experience it just as the pressures of the day may result in symbolic dreams. All of the problems of your life while you're here result in a kind of symbolic dreaming after you leave here. <coughs> and by this symbolic dreaming, you may very well seem to live in this glorious palace with the Queen of the West. But this can't, cannot be a truly real thing. It represents a strange uh, symbolism uh, bearing upon the uh, good results of works. It is merit. It is the fact that you are entitled to a blessed experience. Whereas another person who has lived badly is entitled only to an experience of punishment of some kind. But the blessedness and the punishment both are within the individual. They are the symbols of his own uh, doings and of his own rewards, his merits and his demerits. So it would not be right to assume that these are places, but rather that they are conditions of consciousness. Now to the uh, sage, the Chinese immortals, all of the heroes and the saints and the Rohan of the Chinese Buddhist belief, all of these beings live in the suburbs or on the mountain sides of this immortal mountain, which is the Simiru. They represent, therefore, various degrees of attainment of this quality. 
They represent the levels by which man ascends. And the place where these different beings dwell represents the level of attainment they have reached. There are those on the lowest level who may be called the immortals. And if we study the immortal very carefully, we realize that all he is really interested in is the extension of his physical life or the survival of his consciousness after death. He merely wants to survive. And in order to survive, he has gained his magical arts and has practiced all of these austerities and severities and has sought himself for the mysterious elixir that is made from cinnabar, the medicine of long life. But what he is trying to do is simply to perpetuate his own consciousness. And to the Buddhist, this would actually be magic because magic would be nothing but holding attitudes within yourself by which you perpetuate the existence of yourself. That instead of releasing your consciousness into universality, you are caught with the ego complex, the idea that you must remain you. And to this the Buddhist uh, shakes his head. How can this be true? For you were not you before you came here. You can't remember where you came from, and it is not important to you. Why is it, therefore, so important that you should remember where you go? Is it not more important that there be certain developments of consciousness rather than this link to the perpetuation of the immortal self by magic, which was the action of the immortal? Above the immortal was the hero. And the hero was the one who gained by sacrifice, whose uh, spiritual achievement was not due to some uh, voluntary struggle after immortality, but was due to absolute dedication of life to the service of need. There was no selfishness left in the hero. What do we really have here? We have in the immortals the old arhats of southern Buddhism, the ones who had only one purpose, and that was to achieve salvation for themselves. We have in the, uh, the heroes the new order of beings, the arhats of the northern Buddhism, who were no longer concerned with themselves, but sought to attain eternal life through total self-forgetfulness. And in this way, by dedication to the common needs of others, to find that they sometimes uh, would be able to work forever because the need is forever, not because they desire to live forever. The individual who must live until the job is done if that job is human regeneration, must live forever to do it, but without thought of this matter. The third order, therefore, also representing the saints, is again a reference to the completely purified beings. The saints of northern Buddhism would be the bodhisattvas, the emancipated ones, those who had already attained uh, the great enlightenment. And the saints would be the peculiar ministers and servants of the Queen of Heaven, or the mysterious power represented by the guardian of the phoenix. So here we would have an ascending order of human achievement, of man seeking good, of the individual growing through levels of consciousness to reach finally the western paradise of Amitabha. This western paradise being the place of endless peace and joy. Uh, the place of complete and utter reward. This, uh, this abode was copied from the mysterious palace of Indra in Indian mythology. Indra, Indra being a kind of god of the world and of the air. This deity represented the ruler of the temporal state of things, 
and therefore his palace was the best and noblest part of creation. It could not go beyond creation itself into the uncreate. It was the terrestrial paradiso of Dante. It was the paradise of the Christian as distinguished from heaven. The paradise being the place of the reward of virtue. In Buddhism, paradise uh, is a state of consciousness, just exactly as the temple and the palace of the queen were states of consciousness. Paradise is the state of complete inner serenity. It is the state internally of complete and perfect faith in the reality of things. It is life without doubt, life without fear, without danger of contamination. Life in which the individual is so completely established in the laws of things that the fulfillment of virtue is no difficulty, but is the natural and graciousness of its own quality manifesting in living. The person then, the, the symbol of the uh, ahat in paradise, simply means the bliss of complete enlightenment, the bliss of the full resurrection of the person from the darkness and death of his own doubts, the complete internal acceptance of the law. In the paradise there is no longer any conflict between the universal plan and the individual, and as a result of this he experiences the universe as eternally benevolent. As long as he never crosses the universe, never goes against it, he will never suffer from it. Uh, there is a little uh, fable in Buddhism bearing on this that is rather interesting, in which uh, the Buddha was accused of being a controversialist, that he was accused of uh, attacking the opinions of other people. And he gives the little story very simply. He said, if you show me an object and ask me the color of it, and that object is white, I will tell you it is white. But to the man who is ignorant, that thing which is white may appear to be black. And if I tell him that the thing that he thinks is black is truly white, then he will claim that I am arguing with him. He will not accept but he will not be able to realize that I have properly named it. Therefore, he will regard the Buddha as a controversialist. This is the same type of thing that is carried in the Chinese thought. We have here uh, the universe of jade and lapis, of jewels and of wonders. This is just the universe as it is. This palace of the Queen of the West is creation, as it truly is, in the midst of which grows the mystery of the Tree of Life, the same as in the story of Eden. This, pa this palace is the universe experienced by the just man. To the materialist, the universe is just space and stars. To the evil man, the universe is simply pain. To the ignorant man, the universe is simply mystery. But to the purely and truly enlightened man, the universe is infinite beauty, infinite truth, infinite wisdom, and infinite love. And this wonderful universe, as it really is, to be experienced only by the individual who is capable of inwardly per perceiving and knowing this universe. This is the marvelous palace of the Queen of Heaven. It is the, the world we do not know because in our own consciousness we are not capable of experiencing it. In order that we may have this experience, we must be carried there by the peculiar and wonderful messenger of the deities, which in China is usually represented as a tiger. Not because the tiger is... Uh, particularly sacred to the Chinese people, it is the symbol of heroism. But because in the mystery rituals, the tiger has another meaning. 
The tiger belongs to the cat family, and the feline is the, the kind or is the tribe that sees in the dark. It is able to see through and in the darkness. Therefore, it is the animal that was assumed to be able to find its way back again to the realm of reality after it had been uh, sent out of that realm into worldliness. To come down into worldliness, to pick up a passenger, so to say, the tiger had to know how to find its way back. And the symbol of the tiger was the all-seeing eye in darkness and absolute courage against obstacles. These were the two powers that enabled this symbolic being to find its way home. And in, in returning home, to carry with it the destined person. Now the destined person is the one whom the great recorders and the Lord High Secretaries and the Lord High Chamberlains and the Lord High Administrators have discovered from the Book of Fates to be ready to receive enlightenment. Therefore, in a sense, all these judges, all this vast paraphernalia of the Queen of Heaven simply represents the laws of karma. And if we see this, then some of these rather grotesque and unpleasant uh, augustnesses suddenly become understandable to us. They represent the interesting, remarkable, and intricate patterning of karma. They are, in a way, are the destiny keepers of everything. The God who lives under the hearthstone, the God who lives in the kitchen, the God who hides behind the door, the God of the street, of the plagues, the God of insects and beasts and of birds, the gods of the living and of the dead, are all the ones who administer the fates of things. And these fates are karma. Consequently, every man's karma has an appearance. And most people find their karma a little on the grotesque side when they try to live with it. They find it difficult and terrible. But when the time comes and the uh, great Lord of Accountants and Assessors have decided that a soul wandering in the lower world has by the great edicts, by the great books, by the way of heaven, is entitled to re be received into the abode of the enlightened. We have nothing more or less than a statement that karma has brought to the individual illumination. It has brought this person to the point where the lords of justice, the great judges, the administrators, may say fully and honestly, this soul deserves this. So the laws become these administrators, and they send their messenger to bring the soul to the feast of the Queen of the West. This is exactly the same legend we have in the Troubadours and in the Alchemists. The Queen of Heaven is the Blessed Demoiselle that we find in the poems of Dante Gabriel Rossetti. But the entire symbolism is the same because it represents in every instance the Queen of the Laws of Existence the great powers uh, which administer uh, the karmic responsibilities of life. So having received the invitation to enter into this magic garden of consciousness, karma having moved the individual to a state of enlightenment within himself, he experiences the unfolding of his own inner universe and by the parallel suddenly perceives the magnificent unfolding of the larger universe around him. He discovers that his own eyes being opened, that he can see this mountain that rises in the middle of the earth, that he can see the great palace upon its summit. Not because these things have a physical reality or a literal reality, but because they become symbols of the great qualities that sustain existence. The uh, discovery of the great palace of the sovereigns of the world simply means that man has discovered the universe to be the house of a living God. The universe itself is the great palace. Its roof, its walls of jewels and gems, and its magnificent canopy of stars and sh 
shining lights. But to the person who is not so enlightened, this universe is a dull and tragic place. So it is uh, according to the initiation ritual that the candidate advancing by three degrees is finally brought into the presence of the Queen of Heaven, who in this case is the goddess Isis, the uh, mysterious mother of mysteries, uh, the, the wonderful symbol of truth as forever bearing the saviors of the world, of eternal light, ever fruitful of good, and uh, the eternal benevolent fruitfulness of existence on the basis that the universe is the temple that is forever bearing fruit, forever causing to come forth life. And the mystery of wisdom, the sanctuary, the temple, the inner soul of man, guards very cautiously and wisely the peach of everlastingness. Uh, we can take the symbolism, and by it we can do something that has not generally been possible in Chinese mythology. If you break down into these patterns, you can then become aware, at least in part, of a system. A system the Chinese probably do not know very much about themselves. A system that has never been translated into English. A system that is only been, has only been ridiculed by missionaries. Simply because you must really Know it in order to find it. You must recognize the inevitability of it before you can discover it. It has to be this way, however, factually. If it had not been this way, Buddhism would have changed this pattern at an early date. It had to be that the blending or the partnership between Taoism and Buddhism meant that the mysterious alchemical mystery world of Taoism, with all its palaces and its marvelous jeweled temples, had to be paralleled with and made identical with the western paradise of Amitabha. It was then possible for these two to be interchangeable values, for the Taoist to be a Buddhist and the Buddhist to be a Taoist without conflict, because they were both then talking of the same thing the mysterious palace of eternal light, which is experienced by man in his own soul and then discovered by him throughout the universe. By this parallel and this partnership, we can justify a reunion between the old Indian philosophy that Lao Tzu contacted and the return of Indian thought to China through Buddhism nearly 500 years later. Here we make a pattern, and in the presence of this pattern, Confucianism stands at one side like one of the High Lord Counselors, and Confucianism has its little part also, because when the books are balanced, when the judges have produced their records, when all has been weighed, when in solemn conference uh, the counselors have come to verdict. This verdict is based upon the absolute integrity of the evolving being to whom these decisions apply. Therefore, Confucianism cannot depart from the idea that it is the person who lives according to the laws of the superior being, dedicated, honorable, unquestioned in integrity, preserving all the rights and statutes. This person is the type of person to whom these other experiences can happen. So Buddhism accepted the moral code of Confucius and made it a requisite for the attainment of the Western paradise. Altogether, it fitted into one pattern. But this pattern cannot be explained unless the gods of China are the great principles of universal existence and that the orders of secondary gods, the guardians, the tutelaries, the family gods, and all these represent the administrations of universal law, especially karma. That the so-called worship of ancestors, which was also carried into Japan under Buddhism, 
signifies man's recognition that the ancestral pattern in himself is the basis of a high standard of, him, of integrity if he will live it, and that the ancestral souls moving in and out of life fulfill the law of rebirth. Altogether, we can make a good picture out of it. And while it is hard now, we know that the Buddhist scholars in the first century A.D. were much closer to the pattern. They knew the Chinese language, which they mastered, and were able to translate their own scriptures into Chinese. Among the Chinese, a number of great teachers, both Taoistic and Buddhistic, arose to bind these patterns together. And we have to realize that the Western paradise became the symbol of the universe seen through the eyes of the illumined person. Therefore, there is the proper spectacle of the great wonder of the universal law, the great plan, the radiant assembly of sages. And consequently, it, be, it becomes something for us all to aspire to inasmuch as if illumination comes, the universe will change in its appearance from matter to magic, from magic to sublimity, until finally it is completely possessed or ensouled by the magnificent purpose for which it exists. When we have all these experiences, then in a strange way uh, we experience our place as an immortal in an immortal plan. And we think this through, I think we get a little something out of the Chinese mythology, which, as we said, is a very difficult subject. Well, thank you very kindly. Interesting psychological problem. Those who are fairly well acquainted with the subject are of the opinion that Chinese scholars, within the areas of their specialization, were among the most accurate, careful, factual, and faithful recorders of any people in the world. The Chinese scholar would rather die than exaggerate. And yet when you read very carefully that which he so soberly sets forth, you wonder whether or not he has spent his life in fairyland. It does not seem to fit into the very conservative mind but the Chinese scholar, uh, in many areas, was as broad and informed a thinker as his world and world conditions would permit. The emphasis was nearly always literary, there being only two important projects with which a scholar could be concerned, history and literature. There was a kind of a half-grade somewhere along the line set aside to the astronomers who had to calculate the calendar and regulate the crops. But outside of these areas, there was very little scholarship such as we know it. But it is a mistake to think that this was due to the fact that the Chinese were bad thinkers. There was nothing else for them to think about. The types of scholarship that we recognize simply did not exist in Chinese life. Sciences as we know them had no place. Foreign languages were not considered at all. There was no access to them. China was a strangely remote and isolated country. It lived behind its own barriers for ages. Within these barriers, it built up a very extensive literature, a magnificent poetry, and a very brave and uh, cosmopolitan artistry. But outside the areas of its own special interests, the Chinese simply had no experience. Thus we find the introversion of the Confucian scholarship uh, bringing with it particularly emphasis upon personal conduct. There is no other country that has so emphasized self-discipline, the regulation of personal affairs according to a high code of honor. The whole Confucian code was one of austerity, honor, self-sacrifice, dedication, loyalty, and courage. By means of his very remarkable mind, 
Confucius was able to uh, uh, to honor their names or speak well and kindly words. Uh, when I was in Japan last spring, the last Confucian temple in Tokyo, presumably at least, had become partly an art shop, and the proprietress of the shop tried desperately to sell me a picture of Confucius. It was a scroll that was unspeakably bad, artistically. But to this Confucian lady, it was the symbol of all the good and all the wisdom and all the truth and all the virtue that existed in the whole world. And she read me the little poem that was inscribed on the scroll. And it is so typical, I think perhaps you would enjoy it. Wonderful, wonderful Confucius. Before Confucius, there was never a Confucius. At the time of the Confucius, there was not another Confucius. And since Confucius, there has never been a Confucius. Wonderful, wonderful Confucius. <laughs> now, the poem was probably worth what she wanted for the scroll, but at the same time, uh, the painting was so bad that it was not very inspiring. But this was the, the prevailing theory of the times. Confucius to China while not the founder of their culture, not the origin of it, was in some way the great personification. Confucius touched the core of Chinese life as no other thinker in the entire history of Chinese civilization has ever succeeded in doing. Around Confucius was built the concept of the sage, and for thousands of years, the sage was the great ideal of Chinese life. The Chinese had a caste system which perhaps originated in India, we are not sure. But anyway, the division was into four orders or groups. The first of these groups and the highest was the scholars. The second below and below them uh, was the agriculturists. Then came the artisans, and lowest in the scale, merchants. Uh, as in other Asiatic nations, merchants did not rank very high. But these four levels uh, bestowed upon uh, the highest level the great applause, and this was the level of scholars. Well, a great deal has been said, pro and con, on scholarship in China, and here is a very interesting... We have a very interesting subject this evening, but it is surrounded by extraordinary difficulties. And because these have a direct bearing upon the principal theme, which is a structure of Chinese myths, we must give some attention to them. In the first place, we have almost no knowledge of the origin of Chinese culture. We sometimes feel that China is one of the oldest civilizations of the earth. Uh, this is not strictly true. Certainly it is not true in terms of available and useful records. We know much more about Egypt and India than we do of China. The records of the Egyptians go back much further than anything that is recorded in even the oral traditions of the Chinese. The same may be essentially stated for India, which has a much longer semi-authentic history. The Chinese have also been separated from the common intercourse of the world by an incredible language barrier. It is very difficult for any non-Chinese to acquire a sufficient knowledge of the Chinese language uh, to attempt any scholarly work. The uh, ordinary commercial Chinese can be learned in probably ten years. 
But the scholarly Chinese immediately breaks down into a large group of sub-dialectic peculiarities. Not only do we have the various dialects of geographical distribution in China, but we have another dimension of boundaries. This dimension means that a man who became a scholar in literature will be unable to handle most Chinese religion and philosophy in terms of translation. If he is a religionist, he will be unable to translate the political writings. If he is a politician, the scientific writings will be beyond him. The reason, of course, is that the Chinese basic glyphs are subject to many different meanings according to context and most especially according to the grand area under consideration. Thus, for example, you have to adapt translation of even common uh, figures and ideographs if you are to translate a Chinese religious book. We simply cannot find this common scholarship the one scholar who, because he is excellent in Chinese, can handle all of these different areas. The areas are very highly specialized. Now, each Chinese word changes not only by these meanings, but by tone. There are four essential tones. The, the sounds are identical, but the to tones differ. And uh, by the tone, the meaning of the word is completely changed. This is almost impossible to learn except by oral instruction. There is no way of determining these tones by which the entire meaning is altered. In addition to this, there is rhythm. And in the Chinese written language, Rhythm is to a sentence what tone is to a single glyph. In other words, there are certain ways in which the t words are grouped together tonally and rhythmically. And these peculiarities change the meanings of the words, not slightly, but totally. This means that in the course of centuries and ages, the Chinese themselves, have been guilty of a great deal of confusion. Most Chinese were not scholars. Therefore, they were inaccurate in their use of their own language. And as a result, words were mysteriously changed. Meanings were altered. And we have really no idea at the present time as to some of the most important basic words and terms of the language. We do not, we do not know how they were originally spoken. We are not entirely sure of how they were written, but we have a fair uh, knowledge of this. But we have even less knowledge of what they meant. There's a language which was rich and scholarly, became a burden upon its own people. The number of separate word forms or syllabic forms is incredible between 12 and 15,000 different characters that have to be memorized. The only person who ever graduated from the examination of the classics with a perfect score was Confucius. There is even in China a little deity that r uh, rules over the examinations in the universities. It is the duty of this little deity to befuddle the judges so that occasionally someone passes. This is uh, perhaps uh, no more than the summary of an old Chinese experience. We, knew, we do not have very much religious, philosophical tradition bearing upon the Chinese prior to about 2500 BC. And at this stage, we have very little better than the most abstract myth. Against the unknown background rises the deified form of the Yellow Emperor. In a way, he was the universal genius of China. 
He was the father not only of his people, but of all their skills, arts, and achievements. He was said to have been a most benevolent man. But it is not inferred, even in these early uh, discussions, that he actually founded the Chinese culture. It seems that something passed to him, which he took hold of and revised, edited, modernized, brought up to the date of his own time. Where this older tradition comes from, no one seems to be very sure. But it is evident from the knowledge attributed to the Yellow Emperor that uh, he must have had available a great deal of earlier information with which to work. This is especially true in his treatise on medicine, which shows that he had a considerable background in a Kabbalism or mysticism or astromancy or theomancy of still earlier times. Actually, the Yellow Emperor is merely a symbol, a name, against the mysterious background of an unknown time and culture. And it was very long before this culture began to emerge into the light of orderly thinking. The golden age of early Chinese culture was certainly the period which produced within China her two greatest sage scholars, Confucius and Lao Tzu. These men flourished between the 5th and 6th centuries BC, and of them China will never cease 